just when you thought this podcast was dead, we come back swinging with an excellent episode this week, guys. Thank you again for joining. Again, y'all know the rules. Long break means life happens. Let's go. Oh. I need all the wins. Yeah. yeah. Ain't no else. Gotta get a no call and quiz. Yeah. Gotta keep on moving no matter how hard it gets. Back to Baker. Baker with the bid. Kurt Baker in for DC. And this may well do it old glory. With the try, the New Zealand Sevens legend, Kurt Baker, with the cherry on top. Can you believe it? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the On The Line Rugby Podcast, a show brought to you by the Believe Sports Network. I'm your host, Mike Kanaga Ishii, and welcome back. As I've said before, I'll say it again, life happens, and we're stuck again with three to four-ish weeks of no content. Now, don't get me wrong, does that mean that the, in my opinion, excuse me, personal uh, gripes with the current quality of rugby that isn't offensive is kind of lacking. Yeah. Um, I'll say it right here that I thought that the current rugby championship up to about round two was not really up to my standards. And I didn't want to give you guys a bad product on top of that. A lot of things were going on. So here we go again, after a long break, returning back to the microphone to grumble about our hopefully favorite sport. Uh, if not second favorite, we'll, we'll, we'll consider that. And we'll uh, break down, what we think of not only what's going to happen in the blood as low this weekend for those of us in the American market tonight, uh, also a lot of the current news that is breaking along the, lo- the road. Basically, I mean, we have Fiji being in the news. Uh, why am I not surprised? Possible racism involving a move in England and also tons of news from the southern hemisphere. So let's break it down and let's go to start off. Let's break down the last current round round four of the rugby championship the last of the freedom cup in which the Bach totally sweet uh i was to- personally surprised by that uh i just really couldn't accurately give you a breakdown of a game that most involved discipline issues that i've been talking about for how long and fuel goals so given that as it may let's uh break down with about three weeks worth of re-watching the game back to back to back and uh hopefully you'll gain some new knowledge out of this I thought the game was personally really dirty on both sides, personally from the New Zealand side, uh, just given, now, don't get me wrong, this may be a little bit of bias. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there. You interpret it what you will, but overall, uh, I, I just thought it was dirty. You know, between line speed just being too quick, I, I didn't think that part was dirty uh, for obvious reasons, but and uh, obviously New Zealand reutilizing uh, the Kane single shoot cover D with a little bit of slide added to it was really impressive to watch. But I think because of that, they got a little bit overzealous. I think they knew that in Cape Town, this would just mean more. So I think they brought everything to the table and unfortunately a little bit extra. Uh, you had cleaning out guys in the air. I, I think Matthew Carley called a great game, you know, having Severis go to the bin. Uh, you had Tyrell Lomax going to the bin for hitting. You had guys tackling off the ball on both ends. You know, Jasper Visa's yellow card, we all know. Uh, you, it, the list goes on. It, it was just a overall very emotionally fueled game, which is obviously what most fans are going to want from the Blood Is Low Cup and overall from the TR from the Rugby Championship. And personally, I expect that too. You know, you're seeing probably the greatest rivalry of world rugby. I just wish it didn't involve so many card offenses. I think that was the only thing to me. I want it to be physical, just not that physical. I think that's fair to say. Uh, overall. I think they didn't utilize Will Jordan enough out of the pocket in 15. Um, it was really great to see him there. You know, most of the time, whether it's Razor, uh, Ian Foster, they all throw him in on, on the wing. Don't get me wrong. Guy's still effective. He still scores, what, a try in every game. I think he only missed one when he went out for his concussion and his uh, ankle issue. But overall, uh, it, it looked a lot better attack-wise with him there. You know, you obviously have his ability to run and play within the pocket. But I think what people forget is Will Jordan's use on the Crusaders involved a little bit of kicking. Now, was it enough to put him in the conversation of a Jordy Barrett in 15 for uh, the Canes or, you know, a Franz Stein with the Cheetahs or Racing 92? No, of course not. Obviously, I think that his leg is, I'm I'm not going to say a below average, but maybe on the lower end of the average tree. Uh, it's it's not exactly great, but what he does with it in terms of game management and revolving space is really good. Obviously, putting the Bach into a couple big coffin corner pockets and also forcing you know guys like Cheslin Colbe and at the time Sasha to really focus on you know getting the ball back to the game line rather than forcing it to the playmakers or just going back to a game of kick tennis. 
is obviously a good point of emphasis for the New Zealand attack. It's a lot better than what their current kicking philosophy is, which I still think is broken. Uh, I think this team still has no identity, and I think they're, they're still trying to struggle to figure that out. Now, will the dropping of Leon McDonald from the team staff show up? I think so. Do a lot of other people think so? I think it's not being talked about enough, but I think you'll see in the next recent weeks, especially in the blood is low, that the attack, when not based off of talent, is still lacking. And I think no matter how much you can throw in what can be considered rugby Jesus for in terms of coaching in New Zealand, I think that really shows the uh, overall ineptitude of NZR to really get this done the right way. Uh, I did like, though, to praise the All Blacks after kind of ripping them, that their single shoot D, obviously, with the slide, has the buck constantly delaying their line speed and their breakdown since they're latching on quicker than ever, you know, whether it's Artie Savia, who did get ca caught with a little bit of, uh, you know, not releasing towards the end, but I thought it was masterful what he did. You know, the ability to get up that quickly and be able to secure a breakdown is impressive, nonetheless. Then on top of that, to absolutely destroy the breakdown before anyone else got there is super impressive. Obviously, is an all-time great, but I can't stop but saying, you know, kudos. Props to you. Uh, it, it was just indicative of how they wanted to play their game. They wanted to play the breakdown. They wanted to secure a lot of ball from the block, and obviously, they did a great job at doing so. You know, honestly, I think the only two people with any form of vertical push in terms of running past the game line, for obvious reasons, I think, would be Ches and Colbe. And Jasper Visa. Now, did Jasper Visa get into the, the bin? Yes, of course. But also, if you're looking at it, you know, he brought a lot of power, a lot of security on the tight ball, pick and go. And he also was amazing at defense for the scrum. So can't really knock him there. It was nice to see him back. Uh, I can't wait to see guys like Evan Ruse and the like come back. Uh, Steven Kitts off for sure. But I think having him back really brought a, a little bit of glimmer to my hopes and dreams as to how this Bach lineup is going to play. Overall, I think because of the, the scramble, though, they weren't really focusing on that type of attack that they like to do with that structured single, you know, sliding blocker move that they like to do. Having Vili Daru in the in the uh, bleh, having Vili Daru in, in the pocket and just destroying people with side kicks and deft skip passes they weren't doing that i think they're really focusing on that wallaby style of flat ball frantic tight ball play they're focusing on a lot more and just getting it back to the game line which i thought was uh really scary for them just because like i, I think that they're not used to playing that way anymore uh if you're looking at you know the bach pre-2019 they had a lot of issues with really getting the ball out wide and playing expansive and it really penciled hold them into a certain category and obviously force them to play one-sided. And obviously for any team, you never want to play one-sided. So given that they were, you know, constant splits, maybe a loss here and there, and it hurt the team's overall progress, I think reverting to that shows that their floor is still good, but I wouldn't necessarily rely on that for future reference. I think a lot of teams are going to hopefully try to copy what the All Blacks have done on defense. Uh, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. This defense is really, um, in my opinion, very, maybe not the word innovative, but I think will be extremely copied uh, around the world. I think the Canes did a great job at doing this. It's a good bit of sevens flair. So, you know, maybe a little bit of there and league will make it in. And this is a fresh start. Uh, overall, uh, on, on the Bach attack, uh, I also thought that the closing try with Malcolm Marks could have been stopped. I really think that Severus's strength and lower center of gravity could have pushed him out. He was squatting at the back of that mall. Perhaps he was looking to maybe get in there. I don't know. He was looking more to the ref to call for a sheer. Um, it, it was going to happen, whether he liked it or not. I really thought he could have at least slowed Malcolm Marks down to get at least TJ Perinara there, or perhaps push Marks out if he went low enough. You know, we'll never know. But the fact that he basically gave no effort and basically pulled a I'm not going to say Mark Nawani to was a level of offense with that, but at least in that regard, kind of depressing. Uh, it wasn't what I was expecting to end the game. Certainly what I wouldn't have expected from Sebu Reese, who have praised for basically being that back who plays with the Ford mentality, playing at the breakdown, game-saving tries, great on D, carrying his team. Uh, I was not expecting this lack of discipline and lack of effort in the closing moments of a game, which you know is tight and important to not only nzr fans but just rugby fans in general around the world given that i still think that like i said the box still have in my opinion probably the best floor in footy but also uh the most concerning 
I would say, schematic changes that they need to do. I think Rossi will come up with new interesting ways to really force you know, them to still play forward ball, but still enable a wider sense of play. I think that's what we've been seeing building. Hopefully we'll see that in this weekend's games versus Argentina. I probably won't watch them. Probably just watch the extended highlights, but you know, I think they'll, they'll be good matches. Uh, overall, if you're looking into the All Blacks, I still think they need an identity. Uh, the teams are able to rip them apart in many different ways. And I think if they don't build up that floor and that chemistry within that scheme that Razor has, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it's the same or similar to what the Crusaders have played. I think he's trying to do something new. And perhaps they need to work out the kinks. Maybe I'll wait till next year to see. Perhaps the Blood is Low Cup will show off more than talent. But it's yet to be seen. I think the jury's still out in that regard. Moving on, uh, let's break down my Blood is Low preview for this weekend. Like I said, probably will not watch the... Uh, Wallabies versus Pumas game, unless it's early in the market. Screw you, Flo, for doing this to me. Uh, overall, I do not like waking up at 5 in the morning to watch a game. Uh, but given that, I, I think we'll just break down what I'm expecting out of the lineups and uh, where I think this team can go. So we'll start off with the All Blacks. Excuse me. I think the All Blacks shifting Jordan back to the wing and basically losing AOB for Rico is a massive mistake. Um, as I've said, you know, having Will Jordan in that pocket, I think really refines your game. I think not having Bowden Barrett there really focuses your team on making the right mistakes uh, because obviously having Will Jordan versus having Bowden Barrett who can basically do everything and has a bigger leg, then uh, Will Jordan will definitely improve your game plan and kind of broaden it. Obviously also having his experience showing what he's been doing over the last, what, couple games that uh, having Bowden Barrett there has really saved them, especially against Fiji, uh, against kind of against South Africa, but against their Summer Nations games. He's really showed his experience and I, I think overall uh, leadership to really right the mistakes that this team has in terms of not having an identity, really grounding them and keeping them going. But having Jordan back there really bloods him at that 15. I think putting him back to where he really wants to be deep in that pocket to be able to read defenses and play off of what he sees, not only in space, but in the future sense, being one step ahead. So putting him back on the wing and basically just turning him into a downfield threat is kind of depressing. Uh, he also is probably one of the better high ball players. I'm not going to say he's better than Mark Talea or better than, say, Cheson Colbe, but he's pretty up there in terms of his high ball coverage, and I would love to have seen him play more box kicky style and kind of force it at the line, ship it, and just have him work. But, you know, oh well. First world problems, I guess. Uh, also losing ALB despite his form over the last couple months to Rico. I don't know. While I do admit that Rico Yoana is a center, uh, I think he's developed more in his defensive and scheme wise in terms of his not only his ability to read space, but also his ability to play outside of himself um, is great. I think ALB's form over the last couple months has really proven to be an asset for the All Blacks rather than not. You know, if you look at Fiji and his ability to break the line or, you know, just in his provincial comps in Super Rugby with the Chiefs, he's probably been one of the better weapons when healthy to be able to divert the ball, have to be able to play dummies, roll out, uh, obviously play that little jukey game that he has now. I think I kind of like it. You, you know, I would say he, we have Ches and Colby at home with how he's been doing. But uh, I guess putting Rico Yuan in, just throwing out a USC 2018 lineup is okay, I guess. If you have the right game plan, we're going to see. Obviously, we're not expecting the world from the Wallabies, but, you know, still, it would be nice to, you know, have them play a little bit of game plan ball. Uh, Wallabies kind of did the same thing. I think the healthy Angus Bell and a renewed Nella Tupo are nightmares for Razor, no matter the tight five. I think it's one of the few departments that I got the Wallabies wiping the floor with the All Blacks of. Um, yes, they also went with kind of a talent-based lineup, which is, like, the greatest hits of, the, like, the, what, the last five or six years. But I, I still... I still have hope, okay? A, a lot of people, I think, have written off Joe Schmidt, but I think you can't write off the legendary coach's ability to attack and to game plan, especially with his former all-black pedigree. Um, I still wish that the Wallabies had thrown in a JOC or Tom Lina to start to blood him and use JOC in the 12-ish jersey that they normally have him in for the Reds. Uh, but if they use a little steel in the pocket again, I think it should be interesting. Obviously, keeping him there, I think, is where he's most 
composed and most ready to not only def- deliver the ball, but to manage his best game. Obviously, I think you're not going to win because of Lolicio. He's like an Alex Smith, I think, is his ceiling. You're going to win because of him and his management if you put him in the right situations. I think his low floor, if you're looking at it right, would probably be, okay, I'm not going to say Jamarcus Russell because he has improved, but uh, maybe 2008 Matt Leinert. Maybe, you know, you're getting a couple good games out of him, but then the rest of it is uh, Being that as it may, uh, I, I think it could be, you know, an interesting choice. It just all depends on how they want to play. Perhaps they want to do different styles of play and have Lina just basically be, you know, the distributor and have uh, Lola Seal be the pocket player. Who knows? But putting him on the bench is still, you know, intriguing. Eventually, I think it'll uh, brighten up into a good choice that they picked Lina, who I thought for the Reds did a okay job at really forcing a lot of things to happen with them. Uh, despite losing JOC for basically the whole year. Uh, I think it's a fun fact that I learned this weekend that no New Zealand-born coach has ever lost their opening blood as low to the All Blacks. I think that'll be interesting. I think for Joe Schmidt, this is obviously a big game for him, You know, not only just being a Kiwi, but also being a part of the former All Black staff. Uh, he's done great things. No one expected him, again, to be a head coach anymore, given his situation, but... Being that as it may, I think he'll make the best of it. You know, he's still, in my opinion, one of the best schematic players and coaches out there. You know, he gets the best out of his players, puts them in the best situations to win. Now, I know that the, the it's going to take a miracle to fix the Wallabies at this rate. In my personal opinion, I still stand on that. But I think given his knowledge of the All Blacks and, you know, at their best, in my opinion, versus the in the World Cup, probably since 2017, um, and given their continuing lack of identity with Razor, I think it would be smart to really play off of that knowledge and use the best of the Wallabies, which he has in his lineup, uh, to his advantage. I'm hoping to really see some real innovation and fight from the relatively dead Wallaby side. Uh, like I said, this does my integ- uh, intrigue, my hopes and dreams, but obviously we have to be realistic. I'm not expecting the All Blacks to let alone lose the series, let alone get blown out in their own house. But, you know, while they do basically own alien stadium uh i would like to expect just hope that the game will be tight maybe it will go down to a drop goal below the seal i don't know maybe a late try that gets them the two points to get you know over the hump i don't know i'm expecting brilliance somehow some way from joe schmidt and he'll get the best out of these boys and get them ready to roll uh you know when you're watching a lot of the all black stories whether it's Bowden barrett uh d mac uh alb the list goes on a lot of them are just shopping playing golf, going to the beach. Now, I understand this is a lot of things that most players were doing on vacation. I would do too. But uh, to be the only thing that you're really focusing on and a lot of the practice highlights and not being that great is kind of worrisome to me. And I think they're going to come into this game a little bit. What's the word? Uh, a lot of the Hawaiians would say hi, Maka Maka, but I would say half cocked to basically say that, oh, this game is going to be a blow and just take it easy for the first half. Um, I would expect Joe Schmidt to really level a lot of these disadvantages to them at the half and just pour it on. But obviously that second half, all blacks would probably have to come back with Bowden Barrett still at 15 would be interesting to see. I'm again, not expecting them to lose a series, but it would be a nice change of pace to have them maybe get their bell rung just a little bit. Just a little bit. You know, everyone knows the all blacks are the best. No one's disputing that everyone's going to probably say that the wallabies are still going to stink, but one could dream, right? Now then, let's move up a little bit north. I realized that I haven't really done a lot of premiership news, a lot of premiership breakdowns. I really think I should do more. Uh, perhaps, perhaps, maybe. Just a little consideration for the future. Audience, people, ad people, I don't know. Uh, funders of this podcast for the eventual future of my unpaid tenure here uh, to keep ro- this rolling. Overall, I do think that we can maybe just maybe squeeze in a little bit more premiership coverage. Uh, hopefully I can afford to buy a package for them. Um, I think TRC is a huge, huge waste of time and money. It's a money hole on a terrible platform like TRN, especially with my current situation with them. But given that as it may, uh, I hope to maybe, you know, if not pirating, Maybe we'll make time. The games are early in the morning. I don't really want to wake up. I'm not a morning person. I don't know if you are. I'm certainly not. Uh, 
I hate watching the games not live. That's just me. So to me, watching it not live when I basically already know the outcome because I have most of the premiership note on my post notifications for Instagram kind of ruins it for me. But we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll give it a tentative, I guess, for this. But I, I think this is big news not only just for me because I'm a Sales Sharks fan, but overall in the sense of rugby. Uh, these two uh, stories really go hand in hand together. I think that you really need to focus on the little nuances of what they're trying to do. For starters, let's go into the sale story. Uh, obviously, the sale is rolling out YCL Naya Salevu at 13. Uh, I was not expecting this, to be totally honest with you. It's a very intriguing use of his talents. While I do know, don't get me wrong, that he is known to be a center at time, uh, I think, obviously, watching him from his tenure with Fiji, mostly on the wing, is kind of where I normally thought he would be. Uh, I know his time in Toulon was a little bit mixed in that spot, but again, interesting use of his talents. I was not expecting this to be the end-all, be-all uh, replacement for Manu Tuilagi, who I think is should have been kept. Uh, I could go on for this for hours. I think losing him, uh, Augustine Crivi, which for obvious reasons, he's going into retirement, but losing all the guys they did, mostly due to contact, uh, contract situations and obviously a little bit of scheme. Um, I think a lot of those guys are just tired of losing, to be totally honest with you. Sale has always been the New York Yankees uh, without the titles of my dreams for Premiership Rugby, just given the fact that, you know, they always have a great lineup. You're always rolling into the year thinking that this is our year, and I hate to pull out the Cowboys meme, but that's probably where they're going to be. I hope not this year, but probably. Um, just overall, you know, they're a team with a great lineup that never really pans out. I haven't seen them in my, what, almost ew, six, seven years of watching rugby and being a part of this community uh win the premiership and it really sucks uh i really like the passion that they bring to the table they have great coaching staff great fans uh i eventually do want to go to manchester to watch a game but obviously if they're gonna keep playing like this it might be a bad investment uh just given the fact of the british pound being so you know dominant at least at the current time of this recording that obviously could change but uh uh, Alex Anderson did cite the use of a different attacking edge, you know, just emphasizing his ability to find outside breaks and offloads in tight spaces. Uh, it really obviously contracts with Tuilagi's more direct physical play. Again, he is not Manu Tuilagi. They should have kept him. They should have kept Sam James. They should have kept a lot of people. But, you know, especially Manu, who is open to do a hometown discount. But, ah, uh, I don't get it. Why did the Dupria brothers and, uh, you know, the rest of their lineup. I know Kwan Dickey is good, but he, my, it, he is, oh, I understand he went to the bin. I understand he was not necessarily the greatest player when, when you know, his availability was out. But, you know, he's Mono Tuilagi. Like, he's still good despite his age. Come on, people. But given that as it may, and my certain, uh, I guess reservations about this move. Uh, I, I I do agree. It does give a different edge. I think he would be more along the lines of a playmaker rather than a uh, bowling ball in a china shop. I guess you know, nice love is more likely to step you. He's more likely to distribute the ball better, uh, find obviously better options, and attack the space differently than a downhill unit. Perhaps they're looking to spread the ball out a little bit more. You know, having AJ McGinty leave. Uh, getting Rafi Quirk back from injury, I think, will help this. Just spreading out the attack on different areas, uh, forcing the opposing team to look at every read, not just one read or two reads of the team's lineup, was interesting. Overall, I think Hi Sanderson really highlighted his relaxed, you know, kind of obviously locked in demeanor, which obviously has had a positive effect on Fiji and supposedly has had a positive effect on Sale, especially the younger players. I think it's a different style of leadership, I think it's a more modern look on how the game should be played. Uh, obviously, Nani Salebu has been pretty big on his mental health, and perhaps that has helped just a little bit with the younger players as well. So given that, you know, props to them. Uh, moving on, I think it's overall just a broad sign of the organizational changes in Manchester to really curb the future choke artistry, as some would like to say when I watch Sale and wear my jersey, uh, of the returning finals hopeful. Now, a lot of people are expecting them to go to the finals. A lot of people are expecting Bristol to go to the finals. I don't know why. 
a lot of people are expecting Bath to go to the finals. I really don't know why. But, you know, I would have expected, you know, maybe Northampton. Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping, hoping Gloucester makes moves. Maybe Saracens comes back and makes a deep run. I don't know. I was not expecting Bath or uh, Bristol to really be in there, especially after losing Semi. But as it being life, uh, a lot of people are expecting that. So hopefully they do not dash my hopes and dreams. That would be a great final. But, you know, eh? all of the Champions Cup is another thing that I'm interested in. I, I, I always see them getting bumped in, like, the what, whether it's the pools or the first couple rounds. So I would like to see them make a deep run. But... I'm not saying this is the, you know, the Jesus saves deal, but, you know, crossing my fingers here. Uh, I think it's a good idea to really get into the premiership and start watching sale. Overall, uh, it, it's an okay move. I really expected a lot more, but given the amount of hemorrhaging of monies that the premiership is dealing with, not really surprised. Uh, I think I'll go over one more story. We'll save the other story for next week. Just... Hopefully that the blood is low does not disappoint me and give me with nothing to really work with other than rent. Uh, as obviously, you know, why said nice. I being the captain of Fiji. I think this is not surprising, but it still sucks. Uh, Fiji not playing their players uh, for all those who do not know Fiji. And this is not a conspiracy. You can look it up. It is widely conservative news that it is owned. Basically owned by a Korean religious cult. Now, it's not race. It is not anything to do with that. You can look it up. It is wide news. I would suggest look at the Vice documentary that covers their uh, move to Fiji, their eventual takeover of every level of the government. And obviously this plays into footy, which is probably the biggest moneymaker next to tourism in their water <laughs> of uh, the Fijians' livelihoods. And obviously, you know, being a diehard community, you know, obviously selling out every year for Suva, the concerted castle of, of the Drua, the team that plays with the most heart, probably my second or third favorite team in Super Rugby at the current moment. It sucks to hear. I'm not surprised again, but sucks to hear. Um, Nyasa Levu revealed that obviously that the team had boycotted nearly their 2023 quarterfinal against World Cup against England. I think that would have been dumb, but I think it would have made a great statement um, to forfeit given their unpaid bonuses and in most of their players' views, accusations, accusations of corruption within the Fiji Rugby Union. Uh, obviously, the players were promised bonuses that were delayed, and it took the government intervention to ensure the payments were made, at least guarantees that the payments would be made before the game. Uh, player salaries in U.S. dollars at the time of this recording were roughly to be about $52,000, which to most Americans and most really anybody from the first world would know that is not any money. Now I understand Fiji is not necessarily in the realm of America when it comes to making money. So perhaps that is like gold to them, but th th that's not a lot of money to begin with at all for an international player. Who's probably the second or third most iconic team in the world in terms of players to watch, whether it's highlights sevens uh, Pacific nations cup, whatever it may be. They definitely have a strong contingent all over the world, especially here in America on the West Coast, where I am from. But, you know, whatever. Uh, for participation in the World Cup, that includes sponsorships as well, which is kind of stupid. This included a sign-on fee, daily allowances at the tournament, and performance bonuses. However, players expressed frustration over these delays, which had been a recurrent issue for years. Again, not surprising. I'm, you know, Fiji is not necessarily, as I said, what I would consider to be a rich country. I, I think it's definitely on, not on the realm of pinching pennies, but definitely on the realm of frugalness uh, is a nice way to put it above all else. Uh, perhaps my Fijian friends uh, sometime when I go back home will be better able to explain the situation. But yeah, I'm not surprised by this. Uh, overall, you know, I think these bonuses were just delayed due to the fact that they just didn't have the money to begin with. And I think they overpromised and underdelivered maybe. Or perhaps they just wanted to save the money and give it to the Korean cultists who currently make most of their money by having Korean markets and growing kimchi, of all things, and selling books on the side of the road. Again, watch the Vice documentary. Look up CNN, Reuters, World News. It's a big thing. I think this played a lot into this, and uh, you'll see why. It was a obviously a significant distraction for the team. I've uh, nice to have cited their focuses on 
was really affected during crucial matches and I think killed them in a lot of ways in that comp. I really think they could have honestly got to the final. Revealing this kind of hurts. Uh, and seeing that they probably could have got deeper if they were more composed and more locked in would have hurt a little bit. But I think, honestly, forfeiting would have been a bigger statement. I understand that they kind of lost, but, like, come on, guys. Like, you got to do what you got to do. Make a statement um, that would have said numbers around the world. You know, again, with the biggest community and probably one of the most diehard fans around the world, Fiji, Fijians show up to any tournament, whether it's Super Rugby, the World Cup, Pacific Nations, they're all over the place. Uh, I think this would have said numbers and spoken to a wider, uh, I, I think, investment gap in what World Rugby has had. Um, this is something I'll discuss more after the Autumn Nations when things die down. So you guys will have interesting things to hear and learn about. You know, obviously, as more information develops, it, it is a long form disaster that World Rugby has had in terms of income investment in certain things and also uh, paying the players the right way, insurance and, and ensuring guarantees that they've done to players, whether it's at the union level, uh, at the team level, you know, they've shuttered teams. We've all talked about the premiership lack of transparency, the MLR, uh, you know, let's see, Canada's level of transparency, South Africa, which is basically funded by the rugby team and great white shark tourism. Yeah, it, it's uh, you're hanging by the breath of a limb right now. And this is, again, where my August MP show thing comes in. Diversify your investments, people. Come on, you got to you, I got hope in you. Just, just get it before we get to America. No more private equity. Focus on grassroots development. It's not that hard. But overall, again, I could talk about this for days. But it is just another symptom of a widespread development that I think more people should be not only paying attention to, but more people should be addressing on the whole. Um, again, we're going to save the topic, which I think is really saucy for next week. I think I'm at about 30 minutes. Uh, so to give your ears a rest from my incessant ranting, uh, we're going to cut it off here, and I will see you guys next week, hopefully. Cross my fingers. Uh, we are in the process of a career change again at home. So... Being that as it may, you may not see me. I may ghost you for another week or two. Uh, you, you know, you never know. I'm like that weird girlfriend that honestly is like you up at two in the morning after not talking to you after the first date. Perhaps I jumped out of the bathroom window because I didn't think the date was going well. Uh, you never know. But anyways, I am going odd on a limb. So I will see you guys next week. Peace.